Hey, hey, there you are. Oh, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, my man. Okay. There we go. Nothing to these it, right? Things, these things are so weird. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. How are you? Good. I like the bow tie, man. It blends right in with the shirt. I know. Styling and profiling as usual. <laughs> well, hey. cool. Thanks for making time. There might be some other classes that'll join in. I know uh, just with schedules, some can make it live, some can't, but uh, you know this building here pretty well where I'm at at Forest Grove. Been here a yeah, few times. Sure. We've got an awesome new uh, wave of students into this project, but unlike maybe in the last couple of years, they have zero knowledge, unless they have some just personal, um, if they're interested in NASA and space. So. We have not had a whole lot of time to talk Artemis, talk space, talk any of these things. So their brains are a wide open landscape for you to uh, share all your genius um, with them. And so, you know, I'll let you kind of run with it here to begin with. But, you know, they haven't looked into Artemis at all to even know really kind of what that okay. is. And then, you know, all your great uh, dad jokes and everything else mixed in. So uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and then let you work your magic, and then we'll, we'll move you through with the conversation. Okay. So sharing all my genius, all of my genius should take about uh, 37 seconds. Perfect. That's all the genius I got. <laughs> um, otherwise, I'll just put on a show. So uh, my name is Stephen Smith, and I work, uh, I work with NASA at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, I'm actually, at the moment, you can tell, not the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I am in my house. Uh, you may actually see my uh, dog and or cat at some point behind me. Um, they are very annoying. So they will, I'm sure, try to climb me or something at some point. Um, so I do uh, STEM outreach. So this is the kind of thing that I do. Um, I used to be the uh, on the road travel Bill Nye for science kind of person. Um, I have switched roles and I'm now uh, a program coordinator for a very specific um, thing. But uh, Aaron is my very good friend, as are the amazing teachers that you have there. Hey, guys, so nice to see you. I see you back there. Um, <laughs> um, so I still do this uh, just just with you guys and with a few other select groups. So um, NASA is really focused on something called the Artemis missions and Artemis in Greek mythology is the twin sister of Apollo. Uh, she is the goddess of the moon. So it seemed like a fitting title for our lunar missions. So these are missions that are going to the moon. Now, the last time we went to the moon <clears throat> uh, was in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And we were going pretty much just to make the Soviet Union look bad. Uh, the Soviet Union has now disbanded. And uh, Russia is the kind of the big uh, country that was the, the head of all of that sort of stuff. And now Russia has, does a great job of making themselves look bad. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. So they, they just they're doing that on, on their own. So this time uh, we're going for a different reason. Uh, the reason that we're going to the moon, in addition to just learning about the moon and the amazing science that's there and the general and innate need to explore that we all have as people, is to learn how to go to Mars. So why do you think we would want to go to the moon before we go all the way to Mars? What would be some benefits of starting with the moon? Uh, the lady in the really amazing beret. Maybe because the moon is 
Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Aaron, can you like yeah, shout out? Uh, the moon is a, is a shorter distance than going to Mars. Yeah, absolutely. First person off the bat, got it. Because it's freaking closer. It is so much closer. Um, so the moon is only 238,000 miles away. I can get to the moon in about, about two days, uh, two to three days. Mars is about 140 million miles away. Um, that means it's going to take me between six and nine months to get to Mars. And that's when they're at their closest. Uh, now, really quickly, we, when we're talking about space, we use really big numbers. But it's hard sometimes to get in your head what those big numbers are and, and how much bigger one number is from the other. Um, so I have a, a little analogy to maybe help you with that. So if I'm going to count to a thousand, I can do that in a couple of minutes. It really doesn't take terribly long, although it gets boring pretty fast. If I'm going to count to a million, and uh, both of those countings are the, using the same pace, just counting one, two, three, four, nonstop. To count to a million, I would have to count for a little over a month, nonstop. Not sleeping, not eating, not doing anything else. And also assuming that I can say numbers like 745,942, like in that same pace. But it would take me over a month to count to a million. So when I say the moon is 238,000 miles away, but Mars is 140 million miles away, those are vastly different differences, different distances. Now, if I'm going to count to a billion, and when we get into starts uh, to get going to stars and, and going to other planets, we start talking about billions. Um, how long do you think it would take for me to count to a billion? So a thousand is a couple minutes. A million is about a month. How long do you think it would count? It take me to count to a billion. Uh, the New York, I don't uh, know. Why you make us speak loud, okay? Ten months. He said 10 months. 10 months. So if I can count to a million in a month, in 10 months, I will have only counted to 10 million. So a gentleman in the gray shirt there, maybe. 110 years. 100 years? 110 years. 110. Uh, that's a little too much. Uh, it's actually about 30 to 32 years. So it would take me 32 years of doing nothing other than counting to get to a billion. If I'm going to count to a trillion, it takes me 32,000 years to count to a trillion. So these numbers aren't just a little bigger than the next one. They are vastly bigger than the next one. So keep that in mind as we start talking about these astronomical differences, our distances. So big numbers. Um, we're going to the moon first because it's closer and it, but it still gives us an analog. Uh, an analog is something that you can use to substitute for something else without it having to actually be that thing. So I can use the moon as an analog for Mars because they have a lot of things in common. So they both have gravity, but neither has as much gravity as we have here. Um, Mars actually has an atmosphere, but it's so little that you still can't walk around in it, and, and you, it, it's still very different. So there's a lot of things that are similar enough that we can use it as a good analog. And then I actually got a good slide that I'll show you in just a second to help with that. So the Artemis missions are our missions to the moon, learning how to go to Mars. So we're going to be developing technology. We're going to be learning things. We're going to be figuring out the human body and what happens with that as we go forward in order to figure out how to go to Mars without killing everybody. So um, if we tried to go to Mars today, the wow. likelihood of the astronauts surviving almost any part of it is slim and none. And at NASA, we have a pretty good track record 
And we have a, a, a real want and desire to send people to places, but then also bring them home safely. That feels like a pretty good part of that equation. Uh, we don't want to send them and then like just get new people and the heck with those guys. Uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're going and coming. So we have to develop a lot of technology. And so we have to figure out how to survive not just when we get there, but how do we just how do we survive the transit? How do we survive the trip there? Um, once we get to Mars, by the way, because Mars and Earth are not uh, synchronized in their orbits, I have to wait 18 months at or on Mars before I can come home. So six to nine months there, 18 months once I'm there, six to nine months back. It's a two and a half to three year trip. So how do I keep four people alive in transit to Mars for 18 months on Mars and then another six to nine month trip home from Mars? How do I, what, so, so what are some of the things that I need to think about just in keeping people alive in general, irrespective of whether they're in a desert or on a spaceship or on another planet? What are some things that all people need to survive. There's some kind of basics. You may call the people or can you see them okay? Um, hang on, my phone. there's something here. Um, you can go ahead and call on some folks. Yeah. Food, water, and shelter. Food, water, and shelter. Perfect. That's exactly right. Food, water, shelter. Whether I'm on the Earth, whether I'm on another planet, whether I'm on a spaceship, whatever it is, I've got to have those basic things. I've got to have food, I've got to have water, and I've got to have shelter. I've got to have some way to keep me safe and warm and dry and, and, and pressurized and all those things. So food, water, shelter. So those are our basics. I saw in the chat there too, Steve, I think in Mrs. Mrs. Isaacson's class mentioned. Yeah, oxygen. I see that water, shelter, and oxygen. Um, if I'm on Earth, I don't really have to think about oxygen except for a few uh, exceptions. Uh, so if I'm under the water, obviously I have to think about oxygen. If I'm going to a very high altitude, I have to think about oxygen. Um, so that's something that will definitely come up, especially if we're on a spaceship or if we're on another planet, like that's a hundred percent. We have a really cool uh, experiment going on on uh, the rover that's on Mars, uh, Perseverance called MOXIE, M-O-X-I-E. And that's actually, uh, it's an experiment that creates oxygen from uh, carbon dioxide and from rocks that are on Mars. And it's actually working really well, which is exciting. Um, as I move out into space, there are things that I have to think about that I don't have to think about here. Um, if, if I'm going to live a long time and I'm going to have a bunch of people, there are things that I have to think about past food, water, shelter. Um, so what are some things in your living situation, in your community, for a bunch of people to live together beyond food, water, shelter that make living possible in large groups for long periods of time? All the, way the All the way in the back there, yeah. Uh, communication. 100%. Communication. I've got to have a way to get information from place to place. Now, that could be the internet. That could be telephones. That can be computers. All of those things together are communication. But I absolutely have to have a way to get information from place to place. Brilliant. What are some other things? Oh, I, I should say, I still need food, water, and shelter. Those things absolutely have to happen. Um, but I have to think about them differently. So food, uh, for example, how many of you for breakfast went out and like knocked a squirrel in the head and skinned it and ate it for breakfast? Nobody? Okay. Uh, how many of you had to go out last night and walk to a water source like a river or stream or pond and get water and bring it back home for you and your family to use for the night and the morning? Nobody? So when we're living in communities, we have to think of ways to get the resources to people. So we have a food system, we have water systems that get dirty water away from your house, clean water into your house, so that we don't have to go out with buckets and or a rock and knock a squirrel in the head. 
to get our food. So we need to think about food differently and water differently. Um, and communication also is a great, great, great one too. Um, from the chat, I've got protection from illness. I'm going to expand that a little bit and even include waste management is going to go a little bit into water. Uh, but protection of illness and some waste management go into a larger heading called public health. So that is uh, hospitals. That's the systems that get information out that say like, hey, this vaccine's safe. That one's not. This one's whatever. Use these medicines. Don't smoke. Like all those kind of things. It can also include things like uh, gym, gyms and think, uh, ways for you to work out and stay healthy, things like that. So we've got communication, food, water and public health. Uh, what's something else? How is this amazing machine beyond communication? How is this amazing machine that I'm speaking to you working? What is something that's making that work and that makes the lights on in the room that you're in and that help the car get from place to place? What's a general term for that sort of thing? Um, my friend in the pink shirt with the braid over your shoulder, I think. What did you say? Uh, technology. Technology. What? But what is it that runs the technology that makes that a thing that works? Looking for a very general term. Uh, somebody in the back there, lady with the glasses and the light color. Does that maybe a tan shirt? Alice. Blonde hair. Okay, electricity. Is there a more general word that would also include like fuel for your car and things like that all together? Uh, gentleman with the short hair that's really excited next to Miss Wendy. Energy. Energy, that's it. Yes, absolutely. Um, electricity is part of energy, but then I also have to have other forms of energy. I have to have, uh, oh, and I see it in the chat there too, great power or electricity. Um, so energy will include fuel for your vehicles. It'll include uh, uh, anything that you use to make technology run. Perfect. Um, and then there's one more piece. Uh, so how might I get physical things from place to place? What's a general term that will help me there? Uh, all the way at the back table in the black hoodie, maybe next to the pole. Transportation. Transportation. Absolutely. So those things together, um, so transportation includes like the vehicles, but also the roads or rails or whatever kind of system you have to have in place for getting things from place to place. So I've got a way to move things and or people from place to place, a way for us to get information from place to place, uh, energy sources, water, uh, we got food, and I've got a public health system for all the waste and the, the protection from illness and all that kind of stuff. All of that together is called infrastructure. That still includes food, water, and shelter. But now if I'm in space, now I have to add another layer of complexity because now I really do have to think about oxygen in a real and profound way. But what are uh, there are some other things about space that are very different than here on Earth. And there's a good an, um, acronym that you can use to remember them. The acronym is RIDGE, R-I-D-G-E. So can you guess what is something about space that's different than here that starts with an R? Uh, my friend by the pole and again, uh, again in the back. I just gonna recycle. What was it? No, I can recycle here. What is, what's a hazard, a danger of going to space? that I don't really have to deal with as much here. It starts with an R. Uh, gray shirt, glasses, Crocs, is that Crocs? Radiation. Radiation, absolutely. So the earth protects us from radiation. Now we still get some of that. You've still got to wear sunscreen. Uh, I see my ginger friend right there in the front. There, I'm. you have lots of sunscreen. I get it. Um, I have a freckled little boy myself and, and goodness gracious, if he walks from the, um, go out to take the trash and come in, he's got a sunburn. It's crazy. So uh, we still do experience some radiation, but the atmosphere, the magnetic field that's around the earth, all those things protect us by and large from solar and cosmic radiation. But when I'm in space, 
I don't have that. When I'm on the moon, no atmosphere, no magnetic field, no help from radiation. On Mars, there's some atmosphere, but not enough really to help and no magnetic field. So radiation is a big deal. Um, with an eye, this particular hazard is not a physical hazard like radiation. This is actually a psychological hazard. So what is something if I'm in space, starts with an I, that might be a psychological problem if you're away from family, friends, earth, all those sorts of things. Uh, I saw a hand very quickly go up, my friend in pink in the back there. So information. Information. Uh, no, I have information here, psychological, where I'm kind of being separated from other people. Uh, back next to next to the teacher, all the way in the back, with the gray. Isolation. Isolation. Perfect. That's exactly right. We are social creatures. We are built to be around other people. Um, we were not. We did not evolve with claws and big sharp teeth and like gorilla strength. So the way that we survived was to band together in groups and take care of each other. And so we are built to be in groups. And so when we move away from that, you get homesick, you miss people, you miss your home, you miss the sound of things. So imagine on the space station, one of the things the astronauts talk about when they get back is how much they missed things like hearing birds outside, feeling the wind, in addition to missing their friends and family and stuff. So that isolation from the things that you're used to is a real psychological problem and something that we have to think about. Um, D, this, is a, this, uh, this one is kind of going back to what we talked about and the differences in, uh, in things being um, two days away versus six months away. Uh, black and gray shirt right there in the, in the side. Distance. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I like that you had to check to see whether you were wearing black and gray today. Everybody pay attention to what you're wearing right now because that's all I have to call you on. So know what you're wearing because that's what I'm going to use to call on. <laughs> Me? Oh gosh, I am wearing gray. Anyway. <laughs> um, so I had an interesting situation happen and I'll see if I can show it to you because you have to see it to believe it. Um, I have a very common name. So my name is Stephen Smith. There are actually 13 Stephen Smiths who work at NASA. It is ridiculously common. Um, so I very often meet other Stephen Smiths. It just happens. So I went to a thing in Canada recently, and there was a person who I had only met like in uh, these kind of meetings. So we hadn't really met in person yet. And uh, his name was also Steve Smith. Uh, he works for Blue Origin. So we both work in aerospace and all that kind of stuff. So we started joking about having to come up with ways for people to be able to tell which one was which. So this is my new friend, Stephen Smith. Uh, they look identical. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? We're the same age. We're about the same height. We are both have kind of graying beards. We're both skinny white dudes. It just... The only thing that really separated us was that one of us styles a bow tie. So because of my sense of humor, every hour on the hour, we swapped the bow tie back and forth. <laughs> Just to mess with people. So the distances that we have to deal with are a big deal. So on the moon, I can get things there in two to three days. Uh, one of our partners actually is um, uh, uh, what is the sorry Blue Origin sorry I blanked out for a second there uh, which is owned by Jeff Bezos who also owns Amazon so luckily once he gets involved um, if I as long as I have Amazon Prime I can probably get things to the moon overnight uh, <laughs> it's not true that is not true I made that up um, so two to three days to get something to the moon. At best case scenario, how long do they say it takes to get to Mars? Six to nine months. Now that's only when we're lined up just right. At every other time, there are times that not only can I not get there, just to get a message to 
Mars can take up to 20 minutes. Now keep in mind when I send a signal that would carry the message, that signal is moving at the speed of light. So even at the speed of light, there are times in our orbits where it can take up to 20 minutes just to get a message to Mars. So the logistics of getting things from place to place are tough. So the more things that I can get, the more resources that I can use that are already there, the better. And there's a term for that that I'm going to teach you today. The term is, it's a Latin term, and it's two words, in, like I'm going in something, I-N, in. Second word is situ, S-I-T-U, in situ. And what that means is, those are the resources that are already there. So if I go camping and I get water that's already at a stream that's there, instead of bringing my own water, I'm using water that is in situ. Make sense? Okay. So, uh, G, what is a hazard that I have to deal with in space that I don't have to deal with on Earth? Uh, my ginger friend right there in the front. I saw you put your hand up and back down. You got this. I believe in you. What's a G thing that I have to deal with in space that I don't have to deal with here? Gravity. Gravity. See, you knew it. Don't put your hand back down. You are smart and brilliant. Put your hand up. Answer that question. So gravity, yes. So in transit from place to place, I, I'm experiencing zero gravity. But does the moon have gravity? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It has, but it's not as much as we have here, right? Does Mars have gravity? Yes. Yeah, but it's not as much as it is here. So anything that has mass has gravity. So um, I have to think about that and deal with that. That's mostly a problem for our bodies. It actually comes up pretty handy for other things. So I can, uh, the space suits that you wear when you're on uh, in space weigh about 400 pounds. But in zero gravity, that doesn't matter as much. But I, when I'm building buildings, I can build my buildings taller. I can move things that are bigger because there's less gravity. I'm just as strong as I am here, but things weigh less. So that's super handy. The last one is E, which stands for environments. So the environment of space is trying to kill you all the time. No oxygen, complete vacuum, the radiation, no pressure extremes of heat and cold, all of those things combined, space is trying to kill us all the time. Even on the other planets, same sort of thing, extremes of heat and cold, radiation, all those things. And when I'm inside my spacecraft, there's still issues. The closed environment can be a problem. Uh, you may or may not remember this little thing that we dealt with recently called COVID. It was a good reminder for us that when we're in enclosed spaces with other people that people are gross and they have cooties and their cooties get on you if you're in the same enclosed space so luckily hopefully we're all getting our cootie shots and we're going to be better and it's going to be fun so uh, on the international space station for example sundays are cleaning days and when i say cleaning days i mean like hardcore cleaning not just picking up and moving things and putting things in shelves but like scrubbing everything, scrubbing all the filters, doing all that kind of stuff, because you're reusing the air that's there. It's getting scrubbed from carbon with carbon dioxide and sent back in. You're reusing all of the water. I'm going to say that again. You're reusing, reusing all of the water. So even after it's gone through a person, we filter it and reuse it. Yeah. So cleanliness is an important thing and the environments, whether it's open environment or closed environment, they're trying to kill you always. So radiation, isolation, distance, gravity, environment, all of those things. Those are your constraints as you're creating your habitat. Your habitat has to provide the things that we need. So it has to provide the food, water, shelter. It has to provide communication. It has to provide um, transportation. It has to provide communication. We have to have a setup for public health because there's people. So how are you going to keep your people healthy? You have to feed them. You have to clean the water, get them clean water back to them. 
but you have to deal with the, the radiation, find ways to keep people entertained and connected, find ways to get as many things as possible there because the distances are a problem. Take into consideration the distances when you're doing communications back and forth, deal with the gravity, and with the environments both outside and inside your habitat. Anytime you're working on any engineering problem, whether that's building a new tool, creating a habitat, figuring out how to survive, whatever that is, you have to take the, those two things in consideration. What does that thing need to do? And what are the constraints around it? Do I have questions so far? No, I am the best explainer ever. Amazing. You're on fire today. What's that? You're on fire today. I am on fire. Boy, I tell you. So, so let me mind? show you a couple. Okay. Let me see if I can. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. A question real quick. Sorry. So a question I have for them, and we haven't got into identifying problems and things like that yet, but as we start to brainstorm, you know, sometimes it's it's helpful to know like what not to think about. Are there yeah. some things that maybe have not necessarily, I know there's a, a million things that still need to be figured out, but are there some things that have already been solved or some examples of like things that maybe are no longer problems as we're thinking about the Artemis mission? Sometimes yeah. we start to get to this brainstorm and we think about all the things, try to figure out what's realistic. Sometimes it helps realize like, oh, this actually isn't, necessarily a problem because it's already been solved or checked off the NASA checklist. Yeah, um, that's that's sort of hard. It's it's one of those things, there's so much stuff that it's, it's hard to narrow that down in a way. So one thing I can maybe do, let me see if I can share my screen. All right, can you guys see the PowerPoint thing? Yeah, yeah. Yes. All right, let's see if I can make that bigger. Okay, so um, just as an example, I'm going to show you some of the things that we've already started working on for uh, so, um, extravehicular activity, EVA, is our word for a spacewalk. So whether you're walking on the surface of the moon or you're outside the ISS, that's what we call it. And then this, the human surface mobility program is how do we get people around once we get to the moon and or Mars or whatever. So we're going back to the moon. Last time we went to the moon back in the 60s and 70s, they stayed for a day, maybe two. And then that was it. And then came right back home. This time we're returning and we're going to build infrastructure all that stuff I talked about on the moon because we're going to be going back. The Artemis program missions are annual missions going every year and each mission will be a little longer than the one before it. So the goal for Artemis three is to have actual people walking on the moon by 2025. Uh, we have the Artemis two crew picked out already. We've already announced them uh, four amazing human beings, three Americans, one Canadian. And uh, they will orbit the moon, but not land. And then in 2025 with Artemis III, our plan is to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon, beginning our annual trips back to the moon. Uh, we're gonna be going to the lunar south pole. We're going there because there are areas there where the sun literally never shines. There are craters and different things. So here on earth, our poles have like six months of dark, six months of light basically because of where they are in relation to the sun at any given point. Same with the moon. Um, but those deep craters there, there are places where literally the sun has never shown. So when someone tells you to stick something where the sun doesn't shine, they're talking about the south pole of the moon, obviously. Um, we're going this time with our international and domestic partners. So that's uh, other countries are helping us as well as companies within our country are helping us. And all of this is to get ready for Mars. So we're collaborating with a lot of different partners and you can kind of see this is some of our basic ideas for the first um, habitats and first places we're going to go. So um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, the thing that's kind of all the way in the back behind the flag 
is uh, a little habitat area that will uh, will land and take off and get astronauts to and from the gateway. Um, there's a rover over here that is enclosed and pressurized, so this astronauts can be inside that uh, without their spacesuits. They can just be in their what we call shirt sleeves in there. Um, and then over to my right, next to the words, NASA collaborating, all that sort of stuff, is an open rover that will get them to and from uh, places, but they will have to be in their spacesuits. But then the spacesuits themselves are actually a habitat in and of itself. <clears throat> so let me move forward a little bit. Uh, right now, our spacesuits are like the one that you see with the astronaut in the actual picture. Um, that's on the International Space Station. Those suits are very bulky. Again, they weigh about 400 pounds. They can't use the legs really because they don't need them. They just pull themselves along with their arms. And there's a lot different um, needs for that kind of work versus what we're going to need when we get onto the moon and or Mars. So the spacesuits are going to be a little different. They're going to be lighter. They're going to be more mobile. Um, they're going to be able to move a lot better. So they'll be able to do things like bend over and kneel and do stuff like that where they couldn't do that before. Um, the spacesuits that they had on the moon the last time were a lot like the ones we're using outside in space. So it was very hard for them to move. They kind of bunny hopped everywhere. Um, there's some funny videos of the astronauts having fallen over, trying to get back up. It's like a turtle kind of thing. You just can't quite make it happen. Um, so these, they're going to be able to kneel, bend, get up, all that kind of stuff. And notice how high that backpack is and how it looks almost like the helmet blends into the backpack a little bit. And that's because it does. And the backpack doesn't just carry stuff. It actually opens kind of like a doorway. So they'll be able to go to that pressurized vehicle. Uh, let's see if I can find the pressurized vehicle. Again. Uh, the one in the back with the solar panel sticking up that actually has a space on it where they'll back that backpack up and they'll open it like a door and be able to get out of the suit and right into the space uh, vehicle. Uh, and the suit kind of stays outside. So that's pretty cool. Um, but it, we needed it in, in, to have uh, better flexibility. We needed it to have a better size range and modular design for different crew members. The original Apollo astronauts, actually the original Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo astronauts were all the same size. We chose them that way on purpose so that we only had to make a certain size spacesuit. So they were all kind of the same size. They, had, they were all... Um, military test pilots, they had so much more in common. But now we have tall and short people, we have men, women, we have just people from all over. So we need a much broader range of sizes uh, to accommodate our wider range of crew members. Uh, it has to be rechargeable. Uh, these are all the things that can I was, I was kind of telling you about before where the thing has to do some things and there are constraints and whatever. So these are some of the things we had to think about. Um, it has to be able to carry specialized tools in order to do the work that we need to do on there. And we selected two companies to help us build those. Um, so this is Jessica Meir, and you can see her wearing one of the International Space Station EVA suits. So you can see how big and bulky that is. Um, it's really hard to move around in that. Um, if she was having to walk around on the ground or something, it would be almost impossible for her to do that. Um, in order to get in and out of that, they have to um, have the top part like braced up on a thing and she kind of gets under it and they pull everything up around her. And again, when that's fully, when she's got a little backpack and all that, that thing weighs about 400 pounds. We were, we're developing tools too. And uh, one of the, the program that I coordinate right now is um, a program where we actually have college students help us build these tools. So that's pretty cool. Um, Go forward. So this is the new suit that we're building. You can see how much sleeker it is compared to that one. So Axiom built this one, and then Collins Aerospace built that one. But you can see they're a lot smaller. The arms move a lot better. They can actually have a full range of motion. They can bend down. They can move. And both of them, you can actually get into the suit just by opening the back and stepping in. Uh, we have a lunar terrain vehicle. It's kind of like a, an ATV or a golf cart for the moon. Uh, notice it's not pressurized, so the astronauts have to be in their suits in order to be out there moving around. But we needed it to be able to uh, extend the range of the astronauts, so we're going to be exploring a lot farther from where we're landing. Um, it has to be able to work with no people in it. So it's basically an RV, uh, uh, RCV, radio control vehicle. RC vehicle? Yeah. 
Um, so we can actually drive it with no people on it as well. Um, it has to be able to carry payloads. It has to be able to have manipulator support and provide video imaging, like all this different stuff. Uh, there's the one that we used way back when. Uh, there, those are actually still on the moon, by the way. Those little ones, so technically, we could kind of use them again. But the new ones, we want to be solar powered. They have to survive up to 100 hours with no sunlight uh, because of the day-night cycle that we're going to be dealing with. There's that pressurized rover I was telling you about. They have to be able to, it has to be able to support astronauts for 30 days. So astronauts could live in that for a month. Uh, kind of like the world's most expensive and coolest RV in a way. Uh, it has to be able to generate its own power, protection from dust. Uh, dust is a big deal on the moon. The dust up there sucks. And you have to be able to reuse it for missions up to 10 years. Uh, if you want to find out more about Artemis, we're on all the social media stuff. So just look up at NASA Artemis and you can find out more things as we go forward. Let me stop sharing that. All right. So what questions do you have as we go forward? Uh, yellow shirt and Mrs. Isaacson's class. Um, so you said that we, we would be able to send the messages to Mars at the speed of light. Yeah. How are we able to send them to Mars at the speed of light if nothing's able to travel at the speed of light? So the message the 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 message that came to me with you saying that traveled to the speed of light. So radio waves are light waves. So messages travel via radio waves or via um, um, fiber optic cables or whatever. That information moves at the speed of light. I can't move at the speed of light. Physical things can't move at the speed of light, but light does. And we're actually sending messages on light waves. So again, radio waves are really just a wavelength of light. So, and they all travel at the speed of light. So um, radio waves are just groups of photons? Yeah, it's just it's one of the wavelengths. So um, gamma waves, radio waves, um, microwaves, those are all different wavelengths of light. I know, mind blown. I love that look. <laughs> uh, my friend in the black and the gray. Um, what is the difference between the two suits that the two different companies made? And which one do you think NASA is actually going to use? Uh, we'll actually use both of them at some point. Um, so just like we have two companies that are making the... the so with Artemis, we're going to have a, a platform that orbits the moon that we'll actually go to that and then move from that to the moon and back over the course. And there are two different companies that are building a vehicle that will go from that platform down to the surface of the moon and we'll end up using both of them at some point. Um, the commercial crew program has uh, both SpaceX and Boeing as partners. So SpaceX built the Crew Dragon, uh, Boeing is working on the Starliner. And right now Crew Dragon is already up and running. We're using that, but Starliner is coming along. So we'll actually be using both of those to do the work. This. So it's the same with the spacesuits. You want to have backups for your backups for your backups. So having multiple people think about the same problem is actually a really good idea. Um, as you guys are working uh, in your groups, don't be afraid to work with other groups. There's no prize at the end of this. So we're not competing with each other. We're collaborating with each other in order for everybody to come up with the best solution. Uh, my friend in the pink in the back with the glasses, Can you repeat that for me, somebody closer to the microphone? What, were the, what are the, some of the differences between the two suits that the companies are working on? <clears throat> um, the, the differences are not vast. Um, they, they both had to meet the same specifications. Um, the, the biggest difference right now is the color, honestly. <laughs> um, but uh, I think one... One of them is a little bit lighter than the other. They use slightly different technology in some of the um, electrical components and stuff, but they really do the same thing because we gave them the same set of constraints and the same set of like, hey, it has to do this sort of thing. So they're, they're not vastly different. When they land. Oh, uh, my friend with the, the Hawaiian shirt and the lei. 
Baron, Miss Sykes, I just. Um, how do they, do they have access to like the World Wide Web in space? Uh, that's a really good question. They do not actually. So the World Wide Web only works on this particular world. Um, the way that we have the, we bounce it off of certain satellites and stuff, those satellites are orbiting Earth. So once I'm outside of that orbit, I don't really have access to that as much. So on the International Space Station, for example, because they're moving so fast, they're actually moving at 17,500 miles an hour. So they can't stay over one place long enough to really get that signal the way the planes do. So they don't have the internet, they have an intranet. So they have a little kind of a mini internet on the ISS, but we have to send them information in data packets to and from. Uh, we're working out some way to do that around the moon where we would have satellites uh, parked around the moon that we could send information to uh, more regularly. And is, is, um, as long as you park them in the right way that you can, um, you can park them in such a way that you can always see two even when one of them goes to the other side or whatever. So we will be building something like that for the moon eventually. But as of right now, no, there's no in internet. So uh, they can't uh, stream YouTube videos and watch other people play video games like you weirdos do. Uh, sorry. I can't really see the, the big class there. Uh, so the young lady in Miss Isaacson's class in the uh, tank top right there in front? Uh, so there was like this elevator thing that's gonna go from like Earth to like space. How is that gonna like work? Yeah, that's a great question. And if I could answer it, um, I would be a bazillionaire and like the Wiley Coyote Super G. We don't know right now that it's right now it's more of a thought experiment than something that would practically work with the materials and technology that we have right now. Um, it's a cool idea, but there's so many issues with that because of the way the earth is rotating and that thing that's sticking away in space would lag a little bit. And get, I, there's, there's a lot of technological problems that we would have to solve before that would work, um, but it's a cool idea. But we're not we're not quite there yet. Um, but if you figure that out, please let me know, and we'll split the gazillion dollars that we'll make out of that. That'd be great. And then I could buy all the bow ties. Yeah. How long did the SUV cost? Like I, I didn't quite catch it. Uh, how much did that does the moon rover cost? that you were showing? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Um, so there's a, not a joke, but there's a saying in like pharmaceuticals that while the, the pill that you're taking may only cost 15 cents, uh, the first one costs like a billion dollars. So we are still in the process of developing that. And the developing process is really where the money is. So to develop those, it's, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to develop those. Um, the, the individual, like once we figured out how to do it and got the technology right to build the next one may only cost $15,000 or something like that. Um, but to develop that first one takes a lot. And then the big problem is getting the ones that we build to the moon. The sooner we can get to a place where we're actually building things on the moon instead of having to ship everything there, that's gonna be huge. Because just to get something to the International Space Station it costs me about $10,000 per pound. So if you had a gallon of milk, a gallon of milk uh, weighs about uh, somewhere between eight and 10 pounds. So that would be a $100,000 gallon of milk just to get it up there. So. Stephen, just for perspective, you were talking distance earlier. I know we were talking about the moon, the difference between the moon and Mars. But as you're mm -hmm. also talking about the International Space Station, can you put that in perspective for us too? Because the International yeah. Space Station, while it's expensive, it's really not that far away. So just right. so we can visually wrap our head around that. Yeah, uh, so you are vastly farther away from me right now than the space station is from us. Um, the International Space Station is about 250 miles above us. So if you imagine that the Earth is a quarter, so let's shrink down the Earth to the size of a quarter, 
um, the International Space Station would actually touch the ridges along the edge of the quarter. Uh, if the Earth is the size of a quarter, then the moon is the size of a dime. And in order to put those in the correct distance from each other, your quarter and your dime, and, uh, maybe I should back up. So quarters and dimes are things called coins. We used to use this stuff called money a long time ago before we had all these cards and things that we have now. Anyway, uh, the, the quarter and the dime would have to be three feet away from each other. So it's a full yard away from each other. Uh, Mars would be about the size of a nickel, and that nickel would be 25 feet away from you. So they're really far apart. But the International Space Station is, is would literally like rub the ridges of that quarter as it went around. It's, it's actually very close, comparatively speaking. Uh, young lady all the way in the back in the black by the pole. Okay. She was asking for the overall budget of Artemis to roughly build and design and do everything that it's set out to do. Um, I think we're in, we are currently in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to $20 billion would it be. Uh, my friend in the yellow shirt and Mrs. Isis in class. Um, how are we able to see like, far away like astronomical objects using just telescopes you know well, like you, you answered your question in the question the, the answer is with telescopes yeah but like how, how just a telescope because they're like really i'm just saying it's kind of hard to think you can see stuff billions of light years away with just a telescope so if you're thinking about the telescope that like maybe you have at your house, then yeah, it, you're not going to see a lot of things. But you can see with a telescope that you have at your house, you can absolutely see um, Mars. You can absolutely see Saturn. And those are millions of, or billions of miles away. Part of it is because the things that we're looking at are huge, like crazy huge. So it looks like a speck to you there, but it's so big that you can see it and they're bright they're shining very brightly amongst the dark background but also we have telescopes that are massive the james webb space telescope is enormous the sunscreen for that is the size of a tennis court um so it has to do with the size of the mirror that you're using because the mirror is collecting light from all over the place um and the bigger the mirror, the more light you can collect, the more light you can collect, the farther you can see. So it's just a matter of using telescopes that are big enough. And it has to do also with the property of light, that light moves in a straight line, unless it's acting up like gravity. There's a, that's a little bit of a simplification. But um, that light traveling from wherever has been traveling for a long, long time, and we're just capturing it. So, yeah. Well, Stephen, I know we're near, and I think our hour mark, and I want to be uh respectful of your time and i know you've got a lot going on and we appreciate you carving out this time and i know we'll all be touching base with you again so i think i want to make sure i know we can probably ask you questions for another two hours and part of that will be for us to you know explore some of those questions ourselves so i want to thank you for taking some time to launch off this project with us and we've got our gears turning here a little bit we got some things we need to go explore and learn um but uh Really excited to, to see you again. And uh, I know these guys will look forward to uh, sharing their work and stuff with you along the way. So uh, thank you for a good first start here. Well, I appreciate that. And <laughs> as you have questions, just email me. Um, I'm, I'm always available for you guys. And uh, yeah, glad to be here. Perfect. Can we just give him a, a nice thank you? Not the two obnoxious, but just everyone say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, my man. It's a pleasure seeing you. Always Thank good to see you.